Hi, right, welcome to Bible Scribe. Uh, tonight we're going to be doing something a little different. I saw this video on YouTube, uh, ran across it. I was uh, just doing some study and uh, found this man named Joel Richardson. He has a program that he does on YouTube on his channel. Uh, I guess it's called the the Underground. And the um, name of his video is here on the screen, Debunking Preterism with Dr. Brock Hollett. So he's doing an interview with Brock Hollett about his new book called Debunking Preterism. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I'm i doing this as a response video, really. Um, I hope that it's taken as as just a, a healthy response or uh, critique, perhaps. But, um, you know, I hope that none of the things, if Joel sees this or whatever, that um, he doesn't see it as an attack. It's not that. However, uh, as a person who does hold a preterist viewpoint of most of the prophecies that he will talk about in the video, uh, I had to respond to this. And so you'll see as I go through, I'm going to just uh, hit, um, I'm going to hit points in the video. We'll watch a few seconds, uh, probably a half a minute to a minute of each one. And then I'm going to respond to what's being said there. Um, I'll try to keep you up on what's going on in the video. Um, I, I would encourage you to watch his video. And then, uh, and then watch this response so that you uh, you understand what I'm I'm kind of responding to with more context. Um, and uh, so with that, I'm I'm just gonna like I said go to some different sections and give a response to some things that are said. Uh, so with that, let me let me get my notes up in front of me, and uh, I'll take you to the first one. That's at uh, time code 7:42. Let me jump there, 7:42. And take a listen to what he's saying here. He's talking about the fundamental key for all preterist beliefs, according to, him, to Joel here. So he kind of went through his whole uh, spiel and sort of laid out, you know, this is always the foundational key for all preterists. It's the time statements of the New Testament. The, you know, these things will take place shortly. It, these things will not pass away until this gener. These things will all be fulfilled, you know, before this generation passes away. And all of these type of statements, this is the primary hinge, if you will, for the, uh, the preterist perspective. Okay, so Joel starts off here, uh, I think this is just before he gets Brock on, uh, but he's talking about these time statements, and uh, he's talking specifically about the time statements in the Olivet Discourse, which is recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, and there's a particular one that, that he does, he goes to, and most futurists go to, and that's the time statement that Jesus says, that says, uh, in this generation, he's talking to the disciples who have come to him asking for what's the signs of his coming. He says, this generation will not pass away until all these things be fulfilled. And that means rumors of wars, wars, earthquakes, famine, pestilence, all these things. So, uh, that's the, the time statements that Joel's talking about. However, I think that one of the problems with this argument that, that Joel and Brock are making, and most futurist arguments, is that they focus on a couple statements and say that that's the hinge for preterist view. And the reality is, that is a piece of it. Uh, it's, as far as I'm concerned, not the hinge because there's other broader things that speak to the timing of the eschatological fulfillment that Jesus is talking about. One of them is the overall tone of the entire New Testament. There's actually date type time statements throughout all of the New Testament. Read 1 Corinthians, read Thessalonians, read Hebrews, all of them. They're talking about the now for those people. And so that would have been in the middle of the, the first century, 50 AD, 60 AD, um, before the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. So you can't really ignore that. We're talking about Matthew, Mark, and Luke. All of them in their Olivet Discourse say what he's talking about, this generation will not pass away. They also say in a couple spots that Jesus says to the disciples, some of you sitting here will not taste death until you see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. Then you have 1 Corinthians 15, 51. I'm going to go there. And this is just a couple, but uh, it gives you an idea of, of the things that are said. 
Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Now this is Paul writing to the church in Corinth in the middle of the first century. All right? Corinthians is one of the earliest books that we have. As far as scholars are concerned, it was written the earliest, one of the earliest. So it would have been about 50 A.D. And he's saying, Behold, I tell you, we shall not all sleep. Paul's talking about him and all of the church members. But we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, to on and on and on. He says uh, that is now for them. It's now. It's happening. We won't, we won't die. We won't sleep. It's going to happen to us. Then there's another one that uh, I, I thought of, and uh, that's in 2 Thessalonians 4, verse 13 through 15. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren. Again, this is Paul writing to the Thessalonians. I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who fall fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. So this is Paul saying, we who are alive and remain. He counts himself in that. He's saying there will be some of us here, and we will be alive when he comes back. So they all saw it. This is all through the New Testament. They all saw it as it's going to be in our lives. It's going to happen. And so the whole of the New Testament, I think, is a witness to this time frame uh, argument that the futurists try to rebuff so heavily. They try to kick back against it. But you really can't. It's all through the New Testament. Okay, then there's also the Old Testament, which talks about the prophecies that would occur, most of them being fulfilled in Christ, all right, when he came. And then you also have, there's a huge body of witness outside of the scriptures as well. If you read the prophecies of Baruch, there's one, two, three, four Baruch books. And there's Esdras, one and two. Uh, and those all have the same type of prophetic stuff that refers to the time of Christ when he came on earth in the first century. They're all, they echo what Daniel, what Zechariah, Isaiah, Isaiah, all of these guys. The Shepherd of Hermas, that's an early church writing that had prophecies that also echoed the same time frame. And so I think that it's the breadth of evidence that's, way beyond just those simple time statements that Joel is referring to and Brock will refer to as he talks to in this video. But uh, there's a breadth there that I don't think they see and they want to take the, the one little statements and they want to argue against just those because if they took the all of the evidence then they would have to concede, wow, it's all talking about that time period. But uh, they don't want to do that. Instead they want to stick to their guns and fight against just the little portions, just the little snippets. Just take one verse out and argue that to death. And so uh, I think that's, that's, that's the problem there. Let's go on to the next one. Um, this is a statement he makes at about 848. I'm going to pull that. On the internet, for some reason, uh, you know, I don't know why, but preterists tend to be among the most theologically aggressive. Um, there's sort of a... Um, inflated sense of confidence that you often encounter and they're really demanding oh you debate me debate me and this sort of thing and so you will encounter preterist and it so uh there's not much for me to say here other than i i hate that he has this viewpoint of preterists uh he says they're theologically aggressive and they have an inflated sense of confidence um so i i hope that this video doesn't come across as as aggressive or uh, that I don't come off as arrogant here. Um, I will say, though, that I am confident about what I believe, and uh, I hope that will come across. Um, not arrogant, but confident. And I don't think there's a problem with that. I, I would hope Joel feels confident about what he believes. If he doesn't, he needs to probably reevaluate what he believes. Um, but I just I find it funny that he wants to make those broad statements about preterists. Um, you know, um, it saddens me a little bit. I don't know. Let's move on. Um, about 11 minutes in, we, this is actually um, Brock speaking. Uh, and so let me get there. And this is going to be about the language of Jesus and the apostles. 
Um, so let me just let him talk about it, and I'll respond to that. Um, this language then was picked up by Jesus and the apostles I mean, in places like the book of Revelation, um, the first chapter we see that kind of language being used. We see it all throughout the New Testament. Um, basically, that what that statement would, would mean is that um, the prophets talked about the judgments in their day having a day of the Lord type effect upon the people um, that they were. So the reason I picked this one is because of the way he started the, those sentences there, he's talking about Jesus and the apostles, and he uses the phrase picking up the language of the Old Testament prophets and using it to communicate the eschatological conclusions uh, or prophecies that they were talking about. And I, w I take offense to that a little bit because I cannot say that Jesus picked up the language from the prophets. Jesus was actually, along with God, the source of the language of the prophets. He was the source and the conclusion. He was the fulfillment of the prophets. He said, I, I am here to fulfill the law. He was the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. And uh, so it's kind of amusing to me. Uh, it just seems a little too casual. I, I don't want to talk about Jesus as having used the language of the prophets. He was that language. He embodied that language. He didn't have to think about it. He wasn't using it as a way to communicate to the Jews so they would understand him. That was his nature. He was the fulfillment of those words. So I, I just found that very awkward to hear him say that casually Jesus picked up that language. I don't think that's a good way to view that, a way to talk about it. Uh, so moving on there. Uh, let's see, this is at 11.55 in the video. Let me jump here. And at this point, uh, this is also Brock, and he's talking about... Oh, I'm going to skip this one, actually. This is a time frame reference, but it's kind of overlap, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip that. Um, here at uh, time code 1327, now this is interesting. Uh, Brock makes a point about the writer of Hebrews 12 and talking about Haggai's prophecy from the Old Testament. And uh, so just listen to what he says about this. this is 1327, about right there. So take a listen. Talked about the day of the Lord coming in a little while. And the writer of, of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 12, he actually says that this is happening. This is going to happen soon in his day. But yet this was centuries removed from the original prophecy of Haggai. So unless we're prepared to argue for a double fulfillment of that prophecy, we see that the day of the Lord, um, for both the writer of Hebrews and for Haggai, was near soon in that. So Brock here is talking about... Uh, and he makes a good point, actually, for the preterist argument. And that's funny because he says that the writer of Hebrews refers to Haggai and says the things that Haggai was predicting are happening now in my lifetime. That's essentially what he says. And so that's really, for me, an evidence and a, a proof of a preterist view because that's what all those prophets, Haggai, Daniel, Zechariah, all these guys, Malachi, they were predicting the time of Christ, and they were prophesying Christ and his fulfillments. And so for Haggai, or excuse me, the writer of Hebrews, to say that Haggai was prophesying his time for his current day, which would have been the middle of the first century, 50 AD, that's a support for the preterist view. Uh, it's kind of funny to me that he made that point, but... Uh, Anyway, moving on, moving on. Um, let's see here. Okay, we're going to jump ahead now. Now in this part, this is about 19 minutes in. Let's see. At this point, Joel is going to make some points about the Old Testament prophets. And, and Brock and Joel are kind of going back at this point about the Old Testament prophets. Also, they're saying they also used immediate types of language, like uh, "it's coming soon" or "you must repent" or "you'll be judged." And it's they kind of had a, a sort of imminent feeling about what they said. Um, and so they're comparing that to Jesus' statements and saying, "So that means Jesus' statements didn't have to mean right then. It could have sounded imminent, but been way in the future." 
So that's the point he's making. I'll just play what this section is, and then I'll talk more about that. You know, maybe Isaiah or Habakkuk, uh, some of these guys, they're saying it's, it's short, it will be fulfilled soon, this sort of thing. And ultimately, that happened in about 500 years. And that's okay. But to say 2,000 years, well, that's absurd, that's ridiculous. And so even they acknowledge that these statements don't necessarily mean within the next few years that they can be um, used in the same sense that we argue that they should. All right, so, so what Joel says there is because, the, again, the prophets in the Old Testament, for instance, uh, I'll just say Daniel. So he's, he was prophesying about Christ coming, and that prophecy wasn't fulfilled till about 500 years later. Okay, and so Joel is pointing at that and saying, that's why we can argue as futurists that Jesus could say, he could say, this generation, or uh, close at hand, right now, but it wouldn't be fulfilled for m at least 2,000 years in the future, because we're still waiting on that fulfillment if it didn't happen. Okay, if what he talked about didn't happen, we're still waiting on it. The futurists are still waiting on it, and it's more than 2,000 years, right? So, um, but my problem with that is that he says it's, Preterists would say that it's ridiculous to say that you couldn't say that Jesus meant 2,000 years from now. And I say, yes, it is ridiculous. And, and Joel, the reason for that is you're using the model of the Old Testament prophets. But you have, a, say, uh, close to a dozen prophets in the Old Testament, and all of their prophecies were fulfilled within a few hundred years. But now you're taking that model and you're applying it to Jesus Christ himself and saying... Well, Jesus said stuff was happening now in this generation before you die to the disciples, and it didn't happen for, it hasn't happened, and still hasn't happened for 2,000 years. It's not the same model. It's not the same model at all. Uh, and, and the fact is, Jesus said, I am the fulfillment of the prophets. So all those prophets prophesied Jesus, and it was a few hundred years. Yes, I'll grant you that. They sound, made it sound somewhat imminent to the Jews because they were trying to get them to repent. However, Jesus says, I'm the fulfillment. And, and Jesus' prophecies don't then, following the same model, have license to be two, three, four thousand years in the future. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't compute. Especially when he was pointing at the disciples' faces and saying, some of you here will not die until I come before I come back. <laughs> I mean, if he said that to you, what would you think? Um, and, and this is something else to think about. The two main prophecies about eschatological events, Daniel and Revelation, what did Jesus, or what did the angel tell Daniel to do with his book of prophecy? He said, seal it, because the time is not yet. Right? So that was 500 years but what did Jesus or the angel tell John about his book? He said, do not seal this book because the time is now. <laughs> the time is at hand. He was like telling John, you deliver this letter to the churches because they need it now. They need to obey me. They need to turn from their evil that they've let creep into the church. And it's happening now. So do not seal the words of this prophecy. Whereas Daniel was told, seal the words of this prophecy, that's 500 years in the future, so seal it up until the time. And so uh, I think that's another evidence that, you know, Joel's model applying from a few hundred years to Jesus' prophecies being a thousands of years is, it's not, it's not accurate. It's not, a, it's not an apples to apples comparison. Sorry. Okay, let's, let's move on here. Uh, do, 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 do. Seeing what I can skip, some of it is repetitive, and I don't want to beat the proverbial horse to death. So uh, let me see here. I'm going to go to 26 minutes in, 26 minutes. Okay, so at this point, he's talking again about the language of Jesus, and especially that generation statement. Um, this generation will not pass away. So let's hear what he says about that. He's applying these statements that Moses made 
um, again, 1,500 years or so prior to Jesus, and he's applying it to the people of his day, and he's tying them all together as all part of the same generation. So I like the way that you articulate it. You say it's qualitative. Uh, I think another way of saying it is that it is speaking to a particular attitude, a particular spirit that was present among the people. And he's going, he goes, this thing here that's present among you um, and the people who display this sort of attitude, they're not going to pass away until all these things take place. All right, so this is a common argument that futurists will make to maintain their futurist viewpoint, and that is that when Jesus said generation, he wasn't talking about the generation of people sitting in front of him. He wasn't talking about the people alive when he was alive on earth. He was talking to something more general, like an attitude or a spirit within the people. Uh, and so my, my response to that is that if it was an attitude or a spirit he was speaking against, or a a way of behaving, uh, then why didn't he say that? You know, the Greek language ha is one of the most precise languages of all languages that have ever been written. It's probably the most precise. And so there's words for all the stuff he's talking about. If Jesus had wanted to say, the attitude in you, in you people, in your generation here, is going to continue until I fulfill all these prophecies, or these prophecies are all fulfilled, he could have easily said that in Greek. If he wanted to say that the, there is a spirit within the people that's making, that, that is causing this evil wickedness, and this spirit will be alive in people until I come back and fulfill these prophecies, until all these things happen, he could have said that. It's just funny to me that we can't accept the clear statements that Jesus made as they were. We're trying to find gymnastics, ways to work around them. Um, there's going to be more on that, and so I'm going to jump to the next piece here. Um, and that is at uh, time mark 29.05. Let's see here. Boop. That's a good spot. Okay. Now, uh, again, he's talking about the way Jesus spoke and what he said during the Olivet Discourse. And so let's listen to what he says. Many of the prophets, so, you know, like when you get to the Olivet Discourse, he's clearly, Jesus is like this, um, you know, this uh, maestro, and he's drawing from all of these different um, previous statements, and it, it sort of culminates in this beautiful orchestra, this, this crescendo, um, that he brings all these things together in this very poetic and prophetic way. So um, I, was, I was really grateful that you did pull in uh, Deuteronomy 32. All right, so, so the statement here and the things that he and Brock keep going back and forth with is saying that the, they're trying to make excuses for why Jesus didn't mean what he said as far as this generation will not pass away. And so Joel's statement here is that Jesus is a maestro and that he is pulling text from Deuteronomy, from Moses' uh, song, from the Old Testament prophets. He's pulling all these different phrases and terminologies to say what he's saying. But my response to that is, if he's doing all that just to obscure the fact that he's saying something that's not going to happen, but acting like it is, then that's deceptive. I mean, if I, in any other context, a person who did that, I would call a charlatan. I mean, I would call that person deceptive, like double talking. Uh, if, if, if God and Jesus make things so hard for us to understand, then how do we even come to the scriptures? If they're that hard to understand and clear statements can't be understood out of the scripture, then what chance do any of us have, Joel? What chance do we have, Brock, of coming to the scripture and understanding? Do we need people like you guys to explain it to us? Because that's what it sounds like. It sounds like you're saying that Jesus had to weave so many things together and, and it was so mysterious that he wasn't really trying to tell them he wasn't giving the disciples the truth they had asked for. He was giving them an obscure statement about the future, about the way far future, 2,000 years, 4,000 years in the future, something they didn't even ask about. They wanted to know what the signs were that they were going to see. They wanted to know when he was coming back because he told them he was. And, and Jesus wouldn't turn right around to them and then give them some obscure thing about thousands of years in the future. Here's your answer. 
I'm going to tell you, not like it matters to them. I, it doesn't, I just can't, I can't, I can't swallow that pill. That doesn't make any sense. I mean, if Jesus doesn't mean what he says, then how do we trust the rest of Scripture? Those are the words of Jesus Christ, the King, my King, your King. If we can't trust those words and know that it means what it says, how do you go to any other part of Scripture and say you know what it means or says? That argument doesn't hold water if you believe the Scripture. Okay, I'm going to leave that for now, because we'll come back around to the same kind of concept that futurists seem to have a problem with. It's trying to dance around the plain reading of the text. I mean, it's not Greek. It, actually, it is Greek, but Greek is not hard to translate, and you can go look up the Greek, and it says what it means. It doesn't... Even if you don't like the statement, this generation will not pass away, you could take the statement that he then says, some of you sitting here will not see death until I come back. That one is undeniable. I mean, and then again, take the, the testimony of all of the New Testament. I mean, how many times have you read it? Maybe read each of the books in the New Testament about five times, and then you'll pick up on the fact that they were very concerned for their lives and the lives of their relatives. And then in Corinthians, he's trying to comfort them, saying, don't worry if some of your relatives pass on, because they'll go first, and then you'll go, because you'll still be alive. I mean, you can't get past that stuff. All you can do is argue around it. Ugh, man, I get it. I get passionate. I'm not mad. I'm just passionate. This is so important to me for Christians right now to understand these things. They need to understand their place in Christianity, in his kingdom. We're in his kingdom. We're supposed to act like it on earth, even though it's a spiritual kingdom. Uh, okay, I'm going on. I'm moving on. All right. Um, here we go. Let's see. What's the next one? I don't want to overlap too much here. So, All right, I'm going to jump to kind of the last statement that Joel makes about the Preterist movement. And uh, I'm going to kind of let him just fly. And then I'm going to kind of respond to that with some scripture. And then I'll summarize and then we'll be done here. So about time code 44, towards the end here. Uh, 44. Doo -doo 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 -doo. All right. So just take a listen to what he says here. It'll be a, a, maybe a minute. And so for um, Gentile Christians to come along and say no, all of those descriptions, all of that texture, all of those passages, the abundance of testimony from the beginning of Genesis all the way, really, to, to the end of the New Testament, all of that should be understood metaphorically, spiritually, allegorically, however you want to say it. And all it means is the blessings that we presently have in Christ and the kingdom of God is fully here. Any Jew who is Old Testament literate is just going to roll their eyes and go, these silly, silly Gentiles. And so this is why it's so important, is that we have to have a perspective which understands that the kingdom in its fullness is not here yet. Until the kingdom of God is on the earth, until Jesus is sitting on the throne of David, you cannot say all of these things have been fulfilled, otherwise you make a mockery of the very concept of language. You make a mockery of the language of the entire Old Testament, and, um, and you do it, you know, again, at, at the expense of, of the testimony of thousands of years and, and the blood that's been poured out to, to communicate these things to mankind. So, it All right, so one of the first things he says in that monologue is that, you know, that he, and, and futurists will make this argument against preterists, but, and I think some preterists fall into the trap, but he argues that preterists see all the prophecy is metaphorical, all the fulfillment is metaphorical and allegorical. And the kingdom of God is a metaphor and allegory. That's not true. Uh, I, I mean, I have a preterist viewpoint, and I can tell you, it's not metaphorical, it's spiritual. All right? And that's not not real. It's 100% real. It's just not something you can reach out and touch at the present. Because Jesus is reigning in heaven right now. And I can show you some verses that will tell you that. And there's actually tons of verses that will tell you that. But I'll just give you a few. Um, 
so let me read these real quick. Acts 2.29, Therefore being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, talking about Jesus, he was exalted. And this is the, in Acts, this is in the middle of the first century. They're saying he is being exalted at the right hand of God right now. And that's in the first century. So he was reigning then with God. And having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear, talking about the Pentecost and the great uh, outpouring of the Holy Spirit that caused everyone to hear in their own tongue or language. For It says, going on, For David did not ascend to the heavens, but he says to himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. So even King David, who Joel referred to, saying that Jesus had to take David's throne in Jerusalem, but King David himself was saying that you must reign at the right hand of the Father until you make all enemies your footstool. Hmm. Okay, let's jump to 1 Corinthians 15.25. It says, For he, Jesus, must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. So this is Paul writing to the, first, for the, to the Corinthians in the first century, saying, Jesus is reigning and he must do it until all enemies are under his feet. All right, it was present, it was imminent. His kingdom had been established when he was resurrected, went to heaven, took his seat by the Father. <laughs> and he reigns now in heaven and we are part of that kingdom. Joel, you're part of that kingdom. It's not in the future that you're going to be part of that kingdom. You are now and he reigns now. We're not waiting for him to reign. Do you understand? I mean, it's a difference that I used to believe that as the future, as a futurist. I used to believe, well, I'm, you know, someday it'll be great. The earth's going to go downhill into the toilet, and then finally, thankfully, someday Jesus will come back and set up His kingdom here on earth. But read the next verse that I'm going to share with you. Read this, John 18:36. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, so that I would not be delivered to the Jews. This is Jesus talking. But now my kingdom is not from here. So Jesus himself in John saying that my kingdom is not of the world. It's not of the land, the earth. And so I think we just have to realize that the language of the scriptures talks about him reigning as soon as he's resurrected. He's reigning now. He he doesn't we have to wait for him to take a throne on the earth for his kingdom to be established. It is now. Jesus was the first fruits of the resurrection, and then the dead that had been dead since Adam resurrected and also serving in his kingdom right now. Why do you think he, in the book of Jude, went to the abyss, went to Hades, and came back? He rescued, set the captives free, and he took them to heaven to start his kingdom now, then, and now. And we're a part of it, Joel. And Brock, we've got to be a part of his kingdom that's spiritual in heaven now. And I actually believe there will be a consummation of the physical world in the future but that's not what we're reading about in these prophecies we're talking about. I think it's 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 mentioned in Revelation, but I don't see it mentioned in Jesus' speaking. Um, so anyway, uh, now I'm going to, that's all I'm going to say on, on that, but I'm going to summarize kind of my thoughts on where Joel goes. And if you need to watch his video, I, I encourage you to watch his video um, because he spends a lot of time at, in that section we just saw and then towards the end here on acting like prophecy his prophecy Jesus prophecy in the all of that discourse is somewhat like mysterious and ambiguous and general and not referring to specific people or generations and stuff like that well this is my problem with that I say in my statement here that I've written down um, you seem to be happy with making prophecy so ambiguous, so lax, so general, that all acts of prophecy by God are then subjective. And then all about they're all about the same thing. So it seems like in your eyes all the prophecies just support your opinion. 
that there is only one future day of the Lord, and that all other prophecies are generally fulfilled by virtue of being prophecy. Okay? The test of a prophet in the scripture. Now, if you'll remember back, the test of a prophet was if the prophets, prophet's prophecies come true. Right? And if they didn't, what were you supposed to do with the prophet? You're supposed to kill him. All right? So the way that I feel that Brock and Joe are describing prophecy, Jesus' prophecy specifically, is that it's so general that I could even do that today. I could go out and I could say about today, I could say this generation is evil and wicked and, and there will be a tribulation for you coming in the future and there will be a blessing from God though if you turn away from your sin and repent and come back and obey God. I could say all that, and then I would be just as ambiguous as they are saying Jesus was. And I would be just as right about my prophecy as Jesus was. But you know what? As according to the scriptures, what they said was supposed to be done with prophets who didn't prophesy, or their prophecy didn't come true, they were supposed to be stoned to death and killed, or burned. And so, to say Jesus is words were so meticulously woven together that they were mysterious and didn't actually mean what he said, that to me harkens back to the type of prophet that should have been stoned to death or killed, according to the scriptures, which is what we both believe, what we all believe as Christians. So here's my statement. I do not believe that ambiguity, ambiguity is a part of prophecy. It can't be. I don't think that generality that you see there can be a part of prophecy because it, if it is, then all of God's word is ambiguous. If I take the same rules you're using to weave through the Olivet Discourse and change the meaning from a simple apparent meaning to one that's hidden and mysterious, then if I do that in the rest of Scripture, I can come up with all sorts of things to believe that don't mean anything that aren't tied to the actual words being said. For us to understand God and to believe God, we need to take him at his word, and we have to believe that what he wrote was intended for the people he wrote it to at the time he wrote it to in plain language. And I believe that's what the scripture is. It's, it's not some complex puzzle box that we're never going to open. I think part of the reason we can't open it is because we have decades centuries of blindness and wanting to believe men over God. So I would encourage people that are seeing this video, um, first watch Brock's video, then, if, then finish this one, but then go back to your scriptures. When you have questions, go back to the scriptures. Um, what I usually tell people about studying the scriptures is you won't understand the context or what a book of the Bible is saying until you've read that one book five times in a row. Repeat it, because that's what helps you understand what you put yourself in the place of the people that received the book, especially in the New Testament. These were people in churches at the time under the Roman emperors trying to live out their faith in a time where they were oppressed by the Jews and the Romans. And they had a prophecy from Christ that gave them hope in their lifetime. And so when you put yourself in their shoes and you hear the words that are said, it makes a hundred percent sense as to why they thought it was imminent, because it was. And that was the language and the words that were used. It was. It was then. It was happening. All the Old Testament prophets were foreseeing it, and Jesus said, I'm the fulfillment. And here it comes. Be ready. Again, it goes back to John. John's book of Revelation, he was told, don't seal this book, give it to the churches. They need it now. They're going through it. This is the tribulation. So, uh, I hope this has been helpful for you. This is helpful for me to be able to respond to things like this. I feel like this is so important for Christianity today. So important. Um, there's a book I just finished I wanted to mention. If you are interested in preterism or... Uh, you know, just dabbling in it, trying to figure out, does it, is it really nutso, or is it heresy like the futurists say, or is there something to it? You know, I recommend this book, um, R.C. Sproul, 
Let me make sure I've got it in frame here. Yeah, oh, here we go. The Last Days According to Jesus by R.C. Sproul. Now, this book is, um, I just finished it. It's, uh, he has not come full circle on preterism. R.C. Sproul is an incredible theologian, and his book's incredible because he goes to lots of different theologians for sources and sources them and talks about all the different views, uh, different preteristic views and futuristic views. So I think if you are interested in learning more about it, uh, and it's a good book because I think R.C. is going through in this book the same things that people are going through as they are learning about preterism. And he's wrestling with these subjects saying, and even makes a statement in the book, that he has accepted many of the preterist viewpoints on first century fulfillment. And so, uh, but he goes into a lot of detail on all the views. So I would highly recommend that book. Uh, I just finished it, um, and uh, it's confirmed a lot of things for me. Um, some things I don't agree with in there, but, uh, you know, that's how it is. So uh, thank you for spending time with me. I really appreciate it every time you watch my videos, and um, God bless you.